Um, after having those little diagrams we had up there, that we we started to try to put it, put together a model of of what's going on in um, in the air on a particular day. Um, and after this, when I went home and I started to think about how I'm going to improve my cross country techniques. As you can see, that we've got on these little models of the thermal that there's sink on the on the downwind side, and uh, and that, that varies according to whether the wind's increasing and decreasing with height. So I started looking at um, doing all sorts of things, like figuring out where the thermal was because of where we were in the sink. And so on the day when the when the um, when the wind's increasing with height, the, the sink should be on the down on the downwind side of the thermal. So Generally, when we're flying in sync, you should turn into wind, and um, uh, and consequently, on the other on the other day when it's the opposite, you should turn the other direction. So I started all these sorts of theories and coming up with ideas and trying to work out which way to turn. And so Ingo, for some reason, thought I did this pretty well. I didn't know if I didn't know if I was, but I thought I was blundering my way around, around through the sky trying to find thermals all all day long. But, it, but apparently, someone noticed, and. Um, I was certainly trying to use that as a, a technique to to stay in the good air to improve my priority one up on that list of meteorological navigation. So but on one day you found a ten meter thermal, didn't you? <laughs> and uh, I wanted to know where it was because uh, coming back to the heat source, uh, I wanted to know exactly the spot in the countryside where the bread found the. 10 meter thermal, and uh, sure enough, uh, it was a hot spot in the countryside. And every time we fly over it, it's very strong. Very, yeah. And funnily enough, after that day, uh, Ingo, I was a little boy that came along to the comps and probably not very well known, but Ingo came along and wanted to know precisely where this this uh, 10 meter thermal I'd found was, and. Uh, the penny also dropped as to what Ingo used to do when he was flying around the countryside. I never thought of, of making mental notes of, of where all the good lift sources mm -hmm. were, or, or taking or taking that much notice of where all those good lift sources were. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's, that's exactly <laughs> right. And then now we can even it used to have in those days it had to be a mental memory of where all the good thermal sources were, but now we can just list them in a great long database, and we'll get those. I guess mm -hmm. that's probably what's going to happen in the future. But um, at, that also was a good um, learning point, or learning curve for me too. That that that's also a very good way of um, uh, making sure you're flying in the right air. If you fly to the place where you got a 10 meter thermal last week, you might as well go there again this week. And I, I do know quite a few of, of quite a few instances in in flying in competitions where that really does work. Um, you. It, it, it doesn't always work, of course, but um, you fly back to a place where there's a 10 metre thermal, there's often, there's often a, a really good thermal there again, and, and being able to rely on that, um, or you know, th th that there's a thermal there can certainly improve your, your, your performance on the day. Um, I did spend a lot of time trying to build a model because I I thought that was important, and I, I, I thought that that's what Ingo was doing as well. And then, but I think with a lot of practice, and uh, very importantly, that uh, the more I flew, the more you tried to picture, make a picture of what was going on. It certainly had results. It was very frustrating in a lot of times, and um, and uh, you'd get it wrong. But slowly, slowly, the the uh, ability to be able to uh, I guess almost intuitively, not not quite, uh, think of where the next thermal was, became became more and more prevalent. Um, but just purely by trying to build up a picture of what was going on, in the and a model of how the sky was working, and and try, taking into account all those considerations of wave over the top, the way the wind was blowing, and that sort of thing. And I think that's very very important. The other technique that I use, and I think. I use it a bit more than what a lot of people do. I'm a, I'm not a straight liner. I'll fly along, and I use the wings on the aeroplane, the feel of the aircraft to, to tell me which way to turn. And I think that does work 
sometimes, but it sometimes doesn't work. But I don't know, I still haven't come up with a theory, whether the theory works, but it's the way I fly. <laughs> I like to deviate all over the sky and fly underneath as many um, cumulus clouds as I, as I can. But I'm also doing a lot more miles than everybody else is. And um, it's been quite interesting that in Uvalde last year, where there were, we were very heavily into statistics and we could produce these sorts of results, that it did actually sh show up that I was actually flying in better air for most of the most of the course, but I was also doing a significantly um, <laughs> amount more miles than everybody else as well, and that almost I think weighed uh, even itself up. Mm -hmm. So um, I think from learning, I, I'll come back to now and modify what what I was doing there. I think learning from that experience and and how I used to fly coming back from Uvalde last time that. Uh, just recently and having this, the pure hard statistics there on what I was doing and how it was uh, affecting my performance is that really deviations are, are good and I think as long as you keep the deviations small and I think it's within certainly within 30 degrees and I've seen that written in some textbooks as well mm -hmm. uh, that you shouldn't deviate any more than that and I think that's a bit of my fault and why I was my uh, failing was that I was that the technique's good but as long as you keep it within um, 20 to 30 degrees, I think it is an advantage. My problem is to try and keep it within 20 to 30 degrees. Okay, thank you. So, um, thank you. I think that's um, all I can say on that. Yeah, the time interval could be. Uh, <clears throat> up to half an hour, I would say. It's just a rough guess, I don't know. But sometimes, on a windy day, uh, the uh, heat source can release uh, the thermals in quicker succession, one after the other. You see that um, illustrated when in the stubble fire, when the smoke goes up. Uh, the first bubble, um, has reached the cloud base way by, uh, downwind and um, the um, cloud is already decaying. The second bubble uh, is also at the cloud base and has developed a beautiful cumulus cloud, but it's already dying. The next bubble is, um, has not reached the, uh, the condensation level and um, Probably that's the, the best um, thermal to go for because it's well developed and very soon it will form a new cumulus cloud. And as you come closer to the uh, stubble fire, <coughs> probably um, the um, stubbles have been burned out already. All the energy is spent and only a weak lift is um, continue to, to go up in that thermal stream. Maybe you have the four or five thermals uh, in that um, thermal stream, all released within five minutes of each other. And uh, you can uh, see it illustrated by the smoke. Okay? But it can last until half an hour until the next thermal starts on the um, uh, sunny day, maybe blue thermals. It, it takes longer to kick off the thermals. It depends on the wind profile. If the wind is the same strength all the way up, then it's under the middle of the cloud. If the wind is increasing with altitude, then it's on the upwind side of the cloud. And vice versa, if the wind is decreasing with altitude. Oh, yeah, it happens that they... Yeah, 
you can uh, watch willy willies underneath the thermal and uh, watch the way they rotate and then you fly against the rotation. It's only possible to see when uh, you see a willy willy. Um, <clears throat> otherwise, um, you will feel, uh, like uh, Brett was talking about, um, you, you concentrate on the feel of the thermal. Um, when you get chucked out of the thermal all the time, then you fly with the rotation if the thermal rotates. And then it's better to reverse the turning direction and you climb better. Uh, <clears throat> Otherwise, uh, you can't, um, it's uh, not, not, cannot see it. Uh, for us, the thermals are not visible. Um, the eagles have um, 18 times better um, uh, visions with their eyes and they can see all the dust and insects that fly, uh, get sucked up in the thermal and those um, particles in the thermal also rotate and the eagles can see that and of course the eagles always fly against the rotation if the thermal rotates. Mm. So if you see an eagle thermaling, thermaling with the eagle he already um, found out which way is the best to turn. Now we should talk about um, centering. Yeah? Mm -hmm. yeah. Would you like to say Yeah, that? I could start with that, I think, yeah. <coughs> Talking about uh, centering in thermals, I haven't watched last time. There are many different techniques, but I'll just tell you, uh, talk to you about my technique. I've seen different people do different things over the years. But... Um, um, I, I used to combine a, a, a couple, I really basically combined cent, uh, a couple of techniques with centering um, where I, I probably tend to be a very tight turner and I think that's probably a good thing. Um, I know Ingo turns very tightly in thermals but I um, use the technique of tightening up in the, in the um, mainly use the te technique of tightening up in the, in the strong part and in the strong lift and 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 levelling out in the weaker lift, so that I do rather than just a roll out or whatever, I changing the angle of bank in the thermal, tightening up in the strong core, and then trying to keep you know tightening up in the core all the time. So it's a, my technique's continually changing the bank, but staying steep. Um, it, it's I think a lot of field. You should spend a lot of time. Uh, Practicing your thermal, which we do anyway, I guess, but um, it certainly it certainly helps you if you can thermal better than other people. Um, you, you cer it certainly is a big advantage, and I think it's a, it's well worth spending a lot of energy to to improve your thermaling because it does make a big difference to your performance. But there are many techniques I find, but I still find that the um, tightening up in the in the in the strong lift seems to work best for me. Mm -hmm. um, uh, well, no, what I'm saying is I'm, as, as the lift's approaching or as, as we're coming around, in, like not, not levelling out in the, in the weak part of the thermal, but as we're approaching the the, the strong part of the core and and the lifts in the rising point again when, when the, the needle's coming up again I'm, I'm, I've reduced the bank and then tighten up in the in the core so yeah I'm not I'm not leveling out to fly away from the thermal I know it sounds a bit like that but bringing the wings a bit more level as the as the as the rate of climbs increasing which tends to is, is essentially the same as leveling out towards the towards the, um, the centre of the thermal but certainly I use the technique of tightening up in the core or in the strong part of the lift just purely to try and stay there to increase the rate of, rate of bank in the strong part of the thermal to maximise the amount of time you, stay, you, you can in the, time, in, the, in the good part of the core.
Um, there's a few variables there. Uh, the, the, um, it's that super adiabatic layer where, where the thermal hasn't really formed a, a, uh, as, a, as, a, as a good bubble, it's very difficult, I think, uh, to, I think the, the, the bubbles are too small to circle in and, and also at lower level it's not a good idea to be having really high rates of bank on that you might, you know, you'll probably fly out of the gust and not be in very good shape. Um, yeah, well, we on our model it was up to um, 600 feet. We thought in, in the, the standard models of thermals were saying that that super adiabatic layers in the, in the first 600 feet. I'm usually pretty cautious below 600 feet, even still. <laughs> <laughs> Don't like 90 degree banks. <laughs> yeah, the thermals are very disorganised at that level. Uh, not well uh, defined and uh, not uh, formed properly and uh, I think we should be on uh, uh, base leg or final glide for the out landing at that time and not try to thermal at that level. It's uh, uh, asking for trouble if you uh, thermal down low. As uh, far as uh, the centering is concerned, uh, uh, the angle of bank is quite critical too. Um, and uh, this again uh, depends on the aspect ratio of the glider. If you have a kookaburra with a very low aspect ratio, you fly with a low angle of bank in the thermal. Have you got um, a glider with a high aspect ratio like the S25 or any other open class glider, you can go up to 50 degree angle of bank sometimes and uh, uh, that uh, seems to be the optimum to go up in the thermal. You fly a little bit faster in the, with a high angle of bank, maybe up to 50 knots or so, but um, with a high aspect ratio wing, with 50 degree angle of bank, you get the glider right into the core and climb uh, just as well as um, a light glider of, uh, you know, K6 or K, uh, K8 um, and um, uh, make the best of the thermal that way. But uh, thermaling with other gliders, we have to be very polite to each other. We found out from David, uh, David's talk, and um, it's a different uh, entry and leaving the thermal when you um, fly with other gliders. You respect them, uh, take evasive ac action, uh, open up your turn and always enter another glider from behind so you finish up on the opposite side of the thermal. So we both, both glider pilots can see each other. And it's an advantage, really, also, because when um, you see the other glider climb better, you can center your glider into that direction. And you can help each other that way. And um, um, another glider can be better than uh, uh, the best variometer. <coughs> Leaving the thermal, I had a bad experience in the pre-world comps in, in Bayreuth in, in Germany when uh, I left a thermal in the Nimbus 3D uh, in the pre-world comps. Um, we uh, slowly were speeding up, leaving the thermal, and there he was, another glider, right on top of us, us uh, only three meters above a big shadow came over the top of us. And I only could have, would have had to bring back the stick a little bit and we would have had uh, three dead pilots. And uh, therefore, um, you can only be uh, uh, as careful as can be uh, when you leave a thermal. Don't uh, fly over the top of, of another glider. That can be very scary and very deadly.
you know, uh, on the same line when we talked about the 10 meter thermal and the hot spot in the countryside, uh, it, it was very important in Finland, not so much here in Australia, but in Finland, um, where you had um, the whole countryside forested and uh, there were uh, lakes. Um, Finland is called the country of the thousand lakes. And uh, um, the thermals were created by um, uh, granite rocks left over by the last ice age. Um, they were transported all the way from the mountains in Norway and Sweden, all the way to Finland, and left there uh, as a big um, uh, pile of rubbit, uh, uh, rubble, uh, boulders, and they were heating up in the sunshine better than the forest or the lakes. So those were the hot spots in the countryside. And there were maps available in Finland, which you could buy, and, and they showed all the um, granite um, rubble fields. They were sometimes a kilometer long and wide, and ideal heat sources for thermals. If you knew where they were, you could fly from granite rubble field to another one and um, fly the whole uh, uh, task like that and be assured of good strong thermals all the time. Um, sometimes here in, in Australia they have these um, feed lots, uh, big um, uh, cattle cattle stations with thousands of um, uh, cows all um, in a confined spot or a piggery. Piggeries with um, 50,000 pigs north of Korowa. It's always a hot spot for th good, very good thermals. <laughs> so, May time. Big time? May yeah, methane <laughs> going up and um, 50,000 pigs can't be wrong, you know. <laughs> <laughs> They're always the same. The, the thermal sources don't change. They, they, they are fixed in the countryside. Uh, take the piggery, for instance. But um, on a strong windy day, it's a downwind of the piggery, of course, where you find the thermal. All thermals drift with the wind. And um, not only the thermals drift with the wind, also the, the bad areas, like um, lake shadows. A typical example in our countryside near Tokowo is the Lake Urana, the large uh, stretch of water. And downwind of that Lake Urana, there is no thermal, for obvious reason, because all the cool air from the lake drifts downwind for 20 kilometers and you can't expect anything in that area. So you avoid it. In, uh, I know that um, Ingo uses this technique of knowing where, the, where to fly um, and, and the thermal sources from what we were talking about before. Um, particularly in Hobbs uh, where the countryside was is, is a very good example of Ingo's success uh, in a very uniform type um, landscape where it's quite difficult to, to predict where the next thermal was but Ingo used geological maps to determine where the, uh, the uh, clay and the sand areas were and, and then therefore uh, would fly to those regions or those areas on, on his map um, where the sandy, the sandy areas were to, to get the next to try and, or maximise his chance of the next thermal. This was almost like in those days, Ingo had some supernatural power that he could actually predict where the ten nodders were. But um, I think that it's, and I, I think we always thought of Ingo as that way as well, with this supernatural power of being able to predict where the ten nodders were. But 
I think there was a little bit of theory behind it, even though he did have that, that power, there was also some theoretical basis behind it, and by, certainly by using maps and, and, um, uh, and also a, a great um, knowledge of, of what thermal sources uh, work best. Ingo certainly circumnavigated through the uh, competition better than us by concentrating, putting a lot of focus into, into thermal sources. It's very, very important. And thermal producing areas, if not just particular sources. It all comes back to preparations. Uh, there, uh, in Hobbs, I spent a month uh, prior to the World Comps just flying around in the motor glider. I hired a motor glider to um, uh, uh, research the whole countryside around Hobbs. We had a list of turning points and I flew to every turning point uh, there was and um, the visualized uh, the countryside around the turning point so I could always um, um, easily find it when later on in the contest that um, was a great advantage for me I was almost uh, flying there like a local pilot you know but it, um, you have to spend a bit of um, time and effort to uh, come to that knowledge. Not only the um, uh, trigger points for the thermals and uh, heat sources, but also the uh, geographical features of the turning points. In those days, we didn't have any GPS when we flew in Hobbs and we had to map read all the time, which um, was a real art uh, in itself. Navigation and uh, um, uh, it's all gone out of the window now with the GPS. GPS makes it too easy. But uh, in the old days, uh, navigation was very important. Did you compile with information by written notes or how did you bank all that? The memory here. Yes, um, in uh, here in Australia, we have two types of uh, forests. The, the red gums along the river, they are no good. They are just too wet and uh, they like... Uh, swamps and so on. And um, we have a typical example in Tokowal, all along the Murray River. Uh, you can use the Murray River as a trigger point, but not as a heat source. It's too cool. But um, all the other forests um, inland, away from the rivers, or between Marambiji and Murray River, there are lots of um, um, pi uh, Murray pine forests and they are ideal for thermal sources. They are um, um, parts of the country the farmers couldn't use for farming. It was too poor, the soil with um, um, uh, sandy soil and rocks in, in among the trees and, and there was too much of a bother to um, get rid of all the trees and and they left the countryside as is. And sure enough, we find very good thermals over those um, muddy pines. And um, apart from that, we have sand dunes. Uh, you know, on the Murray um, River, uh, on every river bank, you have all the fine sand forming beautiful beaches. But when the strong uh, wind comes, it takes this uh, sand away on over thousands of years. It uh, formed sand dunes away from the river. Those sand dunes are ideal for thermal sources as well. Yeah. So late in the day, for example, at Awakening, you irrigate the areas, the orange groves, etc. They actually seem to start to work. Or at least have better air. Yeah, yeah, yeah better air. That means you can extend your glide, but you can't... Uh, go there to uh, save your flight. You won't get any altitude out of it. 
Uh, the same happens in Tokowal on the Murray River. The Murray River with all the gum trees is uh, too cool uh, to pre create any thermals. Even late in the day, there's no thermal there. But you can extend your glide. You have absence of sink. A row of trees along the Murray uh, is an ideal trigger point. From the adjacent fields, which are warmer than the Murray River, the thermals get triggered, and sometimes the thermal is right over the top of the Murray because of it. It's drifting that way, you see. But uh, it doesn't originate from the Murray River. Right. Uh, I explained it uh, in detail in that article in 1968. <laughs> but but um, to tell you uh, in, in a short sentence, you thermal up to the cloud base and then uh, fly into wind of the upper wind. The lower wind has nothing to do with the wave. So if um, you have a southerly wind below, and uh, the upper wind is usually from the west. Then um, you leave the cloud in the westerly direction and hopefully in front of the cloud you find the lift. It doesn't work all the time, but you can keep trying. And just to give you an idea, uh, the stronger the thermal, the better the chance of finding the wave. Because with the stronger thermal, you have a better, stronger obstacle. It uh, punches into the inversion higher up. And not only that, upwind of this uh, cloud should be another strong thermal because um, when you uh, climb in front of the cloud, of this cloud where, which you're just leaving, you are practically slope soaring the cloud. But this slope lift is also the primary way for the cloud upwind. And if the upwind cloud is also strong, then you have the perfect um, the pattern to create a wave system. Does that answer your question? At what height um, does the wave start? It goes below the, uh, below the uh, cloud base. Yeah. But the stronger the the wave is, the, the more it'll, it'll uh, go below the cloud base. So when the wave's very weak, it's usually very difficult to get in because the, the trough of the wave doesn't go much below the, the, uh, the, the cloud base and it's quite difficult to get in there. Fred, when you're actually um, getting high in the sky, you obviously can't see the cloud in terms of the top of the cloud. And we know with shear waves, it's, you're far enough away from the cloud, you can see it shearing away, like it's pushing away, so it's okay. We know where that wind is. Mm. You go to pick up what you were saying, the wind below the, the cloud could be blowing south, but the actual wind above the cloud is going west. Yeah. Is, is there anything that you look at on the edge of the cloud that you identify that you have it? Yeah, it's usually the thermal itself. All the therm thermals become rotors. And, and we know that from mountain flying in waves, mountain waves, the rotors are very rough and disorganized and difficult to work. And when that happens during the day and you find uh, difficult to work thermals, you can expect waves up, up top here. Yeah. And would you see, expect to see rotor cloud off the windward side, as in wind, you, high wind, wind side? Yes, uh, some wispy clouds forming in front of the cloud on the windward side, the wispy clouds that later on become the main cloud. And you have to stay on the upwind side of the wispy clouds. And, and sometimes you can see the, the tops of the, the cues rolling back as well. The, little, the, the top of the cumulus looks as though it's actually rotating. You can actually quite see that on some days as well. Yeah, sure. Brad, um, yeah. I've followed you a few times, um, and I, I seem to recall that before you enter a thermal, you tend to do it almost like a little jig away from it before you roll into it. Yeah. Am I, have I missed something, or is that what you do? Um, how long ago was this? 
<laughs> no, no. Uh, yes, I think um, probably a couple of things happening there. Um, I know that that um, there was a while where you know trying to avoid the sink. It, there was a bit of a technique in trying to enter the thermal and avoid the sink. So if you're coming into the thermal from the downwind side, or you perceive to be coming into the thermal from the downwind side, that there might might well be sink there. So would turn into wind a little bit to try and avoid the sink. Um, that's probably mainly, mainly what I was trying to achieve there. Um, I'd like to be able to say that I'm moving off to the side of the thermal enough to be able to, to get my, cent you know, my, my, my first turn right in the centre of the climb, but I don't think that's really what's happening. <laughs> Yeah, but the uh, bladders with the um, dihedro, um, you um, um, like to <coughs> reduce the uh, drag of the wing by uh, keeping the ailerons flush with the inner wing. And you do that by um, um, uh, applying a bit of aileron to the left and top rudder. If you turn, uh, say, to the left, uh, it's a left aileron and right rudder. If you, they are cross-controlled. Uh, and Yes, I do it all the time. Uh, but uh, it, it, uh, it's uh, limited to the gliders with lots of dihedral. But uh, if you have um, a stiff wing and, and a level wing, like a Pilatus B4, it, that doesn't apply. Mm 